I know these people's stories. I know about Pusha T saying, yeah, I grew up in a two-parent household as well. Imagine every player's aim and coach, right? Master recipes on the stove light. But I know about Jada Kiss being like, yeah, I grew up in a two-parent household as well. Hey, I'm B.I.G. Prodigy, DMX, and Pun. Yeah. Killing niggas for fun. Nothing iller than son. Just because you grew up with that structure don't mean... What, what's Pusha T favorite thing to rap about? Selling cocaine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we on boss talk one on one. Yeah, we gonna talk. You know, you you basically you come from a place where I interviewed from Mr. Servon to all these guys, man. Silk the Shocker, you know. I, mm -hmm. I mean, and just looking at how it was down there coming up, uh, you had your mother and father in the home, and I think that's big. You know, when I start to look at the situation, but it ain't just everything because you have a lot of people that make it regardless you know what i'm saying but for you to have that and then they still together now right still together they've been married for over 40 years awesome that's big man that's man. huge when you come from that just explain to me uh coming up as a as a kid in new orleans how was it for you how was it so i didn't realize that we lived in a war zone because inside the walls of that house we had, we had a little small townhouse, you know what I'm saying? Like not anything big or lavish at all, but it was so filled with love and structure that I didn't realize that outside of this house, man, it's a trap house across the street, one house to the right. It's, you know, police tape because people getting murked and people getting shot all in the neighborhood. like. This is considered a place where, you know, people with money definitely don't live around here. Mm -hmm. I never realized any of that until I moved away and went to college. Because when I moved away, I was, you know, in a different environment. And now when I would come back home, I was like, ooh, it feel different when I come back home than what I'm used to up in college. You know what I'm saying? My daddy, blue collar worker, welder, you know what I'm saying? My mom, social worker. So they, I just saw them wake up every day, make an honest living, go to work. My pops worked an hour away from our crib. So he had to wake up at four in the morning and drive an hour each day just to get to work, welding in a hundred degree heat, New Orleans heat, you know what I'm saying? All day, every day. And by the time he get off of work, like 10 hours later, he coming back, he making it in time for my baseball practice, for my basketball games, you know. Still doing this stuff. My pops used to be the dude who wanted to tape everything, video everything. So this wasn't in the era of smartphones and all that. So my daddy had like a big news yeah. camera, you mm -hmm. hear me? And he that he's sitting in the stands. Cassette players. Yeah, he's mm -hmm. sitting he's sitting in the stands and he uh he capturing all the memories for me. So now when I look back at all my high school games, I'm like, dang, I got this on tapes because mm -hmm. my daddy after working 10, 12 hours, you know, Dirty dicky outfit on from welding all day, making it in time because he prioritized that. Like, I just seen that's what was normal to me. So that's how I was coming up. It was like a combination of that. And also, my life turned out different than a lot of my peers because um, the school system in New Orleans is not the best. It's set up to where you're supposed to go to your district school. Of course. And if you don't have a lot of money, if you live in a poverty stricken area, your district school is trash a lot mm -hmm. of times. Mm -hmm. The district schools that I was supposed to go to, they were they were not they were not conducive for raising young black men and women in a in a loving place that also was academically rigorous. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? It was just it was dysfunction and it was like Get it how you live. You know, we're going to have a couple shining stars that's going to emerge from here. But for the most part, the bar is set really low. That's That was all my schools, right? But I never went to those schools. Because my daddy, when I was in kindergarten, they had a school all the way across town by Tulane University and Loyola University. It was called Audubon Montessori. They realized that like that right there, that type of education is free because it's still a public school. Mm -hmm. But... It's also going to show David, that's me, that, you know, my name is David. It's going to show David a different side of life than what we can provide for him over here, where we live at in the East. So right? they had to drive you to school every morning? They had to, first of all, he had to camp out in a tent overnight to have a chance to enter a lottery to get me into the school. Because mm. so many people want to go to the school. Right. So there was like the first 100 people have a chance to get into this school. My daddy camped out the night before in a tent on the sidewalk, and he was number six in line. They had a line down the block. You heard me? Like a line to get in heaven or something. It was like, yo, boo-hoo people trying to get here. My daddy got there so early, got me a spot, 
I hit the lottery. You know what I mean? Hit wow. the lottery. Got in that school. That school, that changed my life because I went there from kindergarten to eighth grade. And every day, although I'm living in one type of environment, I'm going to school with black students, white students, Asian students, Hispanic students. I got to walk past million dollar houses, the type of houses that Drew Brees lives in, the mm -hmm. type of houses like Anthony Davis will be living in when he was playing for the Pelicans. And I got to pass all this up every day. It's on the same block as my school. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? This became normal to me to where it's like, oh, I'm not intimidated by white people. I'm not intimidated by other ethnicities thinking they're smarter than me. Y'all had more money than me back then, but... I was in gifted classes, you know what I mean? So I'm seeing as a young kid, like that. I don't analyze certain things. Yeah, like the whole the whole concept of idolizing uh, material, material possessions. Mm -hmm. Like that was that was dead to me by the time I was in middle school. I was like, man, yeah, your parents got money, so y'all live in this big fancy neighborhood, but when we getting them books, I'm doing better than you in school. You asking me for help. You trying to copy off my paper, you know what I mean? Like. It's life experiences that show me like, dang, I'm lacking in some areas, like maybe having the money or having the exposure to certain things in life. But I'm not lacking when it comes to like, God gave me something special and I got to figure out what to do with this. And that something special was just always my brain and my and my ability to like lead with love wherever I go. I got a wow. question real quick, because I see the things that your dad sacrificed and did so that you could have a better, you know, education and life and so forth. Where did he get that drive to do that? How was he raised? What, cause you know how sometimes parents tend to, because they didn't have, I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure that my son, my children have a better life than what I did. Um, or maybe he saw his mom or dad did the same for him, so he's doing the same for you. I'm just trying to figure of out where course, did that, of which course. way did it go? Yeah, you know, um, in the black community, we often talk about uh, trying to break generational curses. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Uh, I was blessed that at least two or three generations before me in the black community, we just had we had generational love and we had uh, you know generational structure because. Where did my daddy get it from? He got it from his mama and his daddy. That's my grandparents. They were married for 66 years. Oh, so they, yeah. they had that same structure? Same that, structure. Okay. My grandpa's still living, you know, mm -hmm. 93 years old. My grandma just passed away a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, beautiful relationship. Like, when, so you grow up, when you grow up around that, that get passed down. Right. So, so that's important. Um, I got it. That's important. But also, you got a lot of people who... Like, I'm a fan of hip-hop before I'm an artist, you know what I mean? I grew up listening to rap my whole life. My daddy listened to jazz music. So, you know, Duke Ellington, Miles Davis, Charlie Parker, um, Cannonball Adderley, uh, you know, all, all, all them brothers, uh, Nat Adderley, all, all that. But me, straight rap, straight my whole rap. life, straight rap. With that being said, I know these people's stories. I know about Pusha T saying, yeah, I grew up in a two-parent household as well. Imagine every player's aiming coach right. Master recipes on the stove light. But I know about Jada Kiss being like, yeah, I grew up in a two-parent household as well. Hey, I'm a B.I.G. prodigy, DMX and fun. Yeah. Killing niggas for fun. Nothing iller than son. Just because you grew up with that structure don't mean, what's Pusha T's favorite thing to rap about? Selling cocaine. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's not a guarantee that just because you grew up with that structure that you're not going to stray and depart from that. Jada Kiss, I saw his daddy do an interview. His daddy was like, yeah, we had him in private school. You know what I mean? So when I was hearing what he was rapping about, I was like, where you saw all that at? We had you in private school. So sometimes people get in the rap game and they, they, they hallucinate. Yeah, we on Boss Talk 101. 101. Yeah, we going to talk.